welcome everyone. Uh, today is March 10th, 2021. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. Uh, you can submit your questions on Facebook Live, and we've also received some questions ahead of time at wellness at svhealthcare.org. And my guest today I'm extremely excited about is Dr. Michael Calderwood. He's a chief quality officer and an infectious disease specialist at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about him and then welcome on, him on to our show. Uh, Dr. Calderwood is a physician in the section of infectious disease and international health. He's actively engaged uh, in the whole COVID response at Dartmouth Hitchcock Health and actually in the states of New Hampshire and Vermont. He's a leading source of infectious disease information. Uh, he earned his medical degree at the University of Chicago School of Medicine in 2005, a residency in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and then completed a fellowship in infectious disease in the combined Brigham and Women's Hospital Massachusetts General Hospital program. He holds a Master's of Public Health uh, at, from Harvard School of Public Health, and he's board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease. And I could keep going on and on, but uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming and being on our show. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. I'm excited to have the conversation. Great, great. Um, so yeah, the people in this area are excited. They, they know Marie George well, and you work with Marie. Uh, and there, uh, of course, many of the patients here and community members go to Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, for some of their advanced procedures and uh, are excited about the relationship between SVMC and Dartmouth Hitchcock, which is actually growing. And we hope to have uh, more information about that over the next 12 months. So let's just start a little bit about you personally and just tell us where you grew up and a little bit about your background. Sure. So I, I grew up in Massachusetts. I grew up in a suburb, Wellesley, Massachusetts, outside Boston. And uh, I was uh, there um, all the way through, actually, uh, high school. Uh, my father is an infectious disease physician down in the Boston area. My mother, uh, for many years, was a, a preschool director, although uh, now is, uh, quote, unquote, retired, although I think she's busier in retirement than uh, she ever was when I was younger. It does lots of uh, outreach and, uh, and and great projects. Um, and I uh, have a brother um, uh, that I grew up with. He uh, uh, did not go into uh, science or medicine. He actually is a professor at University of uh, Illinois in Champaign Urbana, uh, really uh, with a great talent in languages, uh, which unfortunately I don't have. It could have come in handy at times. That's great. So you give him a call with language questions and he calls you about uh, the pandemic and other infectious disease. It does go that way. Yes. <laughs> so because you grew up in, in that household with, with your father, is that how you went into medicine and then went into infectious disease? Or did he stand back a little bit and let you come to that conclusion on your own? You know, I think this is always the nature nurture uh, discussion. Uh, he did not um, uh, kind of try to influence me unduly in any way. I was very interested in math and, and science. I think there were times I was interested in uh, engineering and architecture. Uh, and then through uh, college, as I really began to focus in on uh, uh, kind of studying uh, science and really particularly uh, interested in the impact that diseases have had on, on human history. Um, I came out of college actually still not sure if I was interested in a, a PhD or a, an MD. And so I spent uh, two years down at uh, National Institutes of Health doing research on malaria. And it was really uh, the combination of that experience as well as uh, time working down in Brazil with the uh, Ministry of Health on a disease called leptospirosis um, that got me excited about the clinical aspects. Uh, NIH has a great uh, clinical center down there. And so getting to round uh, with the physicians there, uh, as well as the real world experience center in Brazil, really solidified for me that I was interested in the patient story uh, and what we could do to impact that. Wow, that's incredible. That's awesome. Um, so do you speak Spanish? Uh, well, Brazil speaks Portuguese, and at one Portuguese. point I did speak Portuguese, uh, and uh, I have uh, mostly lost it over the year. I will say that it most often comes up when I'm trying to speak Spanish, and I unfortunately slip in a Portuguese word, and people look at me sideways. But. Right. Okay. Great. Great. 
Well, thank you. That's so interesting. So when you're not doing uh, medicine then, because I know right now you're incredibly busy. I know that because I work with you and you respond to me when I write you at five in the morning or at 10 at night. Um, but uh, tell me, what are you doing when you do have free time? You know, I think that uh, the biggest thing for me has always been uh, family. So um, I uh, have two children uh, with my wife and uh, they we have one who's a, a ninth grader in high school and one who's a uh, a sixth grader in, in middle school, and really, um, you know, one you know positive aspect about uh, COVID is it allowed us to slow down. I think that many of us were always go go go, and you know, running to this sporting event or that. Um, but it's really uh, been focusing on how we can spend time and um, uh, kind of support their interests, and a lot of those have developed even through COVID, which has been exciting to think about new opportunities for that. Um, I'm a big hiker. Um, I like to uh, paint. I love music. Um, and so, you know, friends and I are always uh, searching out new and obscure music and sharing that. Um, I will say historically, uh, I was a big fan of baking bread and beer, although that was not always the best for my uh, gut. So I, <laughs> I backed away from that a little bit. That's great. Oh, it's great. So um, one of the questions that I had written down here and that actually Ashley Jowett, who helps uh, with the show, had written is what one of the most memorable cases you have you've been involved with. I don't know if you've had time to think about that. I can tell you that um, as an emergency medicine physician, uh, all of my top five most memorable cases are related to infectious disease. And I remember them so quickly, whether they were a tularemia case down in Memphis uh, where I trained or, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a necrotizing fasciitis type bacteria. So um, tell us about one of your most memorable cases. You know, so I, I did think about it and, and I would agree that, you know, there's so many. Um, and so, you know, one that comes to, uh, memory first is an interesting case that I was called into the hospital in the, the middle of the night because there was an individual that um, they thought might have malaria. Um, and so um, really high fevers to 104 every day. Um, and when I went in, I, you know, I did the quick malaria smear and it wasn't malaria. And it turned out that, well, this person had been a, a refugee and may have been in countries where malaria um, was endemic. Um, they mostly had been in the United Arab Emirates where there is no malaria. Mm. And so we started asking questions. And this person had a, a good story that, that fit brucellosis, which is a uh, kind of obscure diagnosis often from unpasteurized dairy products. And we always ask this question about unpasteurized dairy. So this person um, just kind of said, well, yeah, of course, I, I love milk, raw camel's milk directly from the camel. Now this person had you know, been in the country only a few months, but still was suffering from this that they had gotten at the market in the United Arab Emirates. Uh -huh. And so it turned out that we could diagnose brucellosis. It took, uh, you know, a little bit of time. It takes a while to grow in blood culture and the antibodies take a while to come back. Um, this person made a full recovery, but, it, you know, th they went from having fevers every day to having months and months of therapy. But it's one of those obscure diagnoses. You don't expect someone to say, oh, of course, raw camel's milk. So <laughs> that's always a memorable one. That is a very memorable one. And, and for those in the audience that are interested in these types of cases, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, books that are actually specific on cases. And one that's great that does not seem like an infectious disease novel uh, or actual uh, nonfiction, uh, but turns out to be, and that's The Lost City of the Monkey God. Have you, have you read that? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So we will, before, right, actually, right before we move into COVID, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about your title and your responsibilities uh, as the chief quality officer. And by the way, congratulations. That's a new appointment for you. You've been doing the, in the associate um, uh, position for a long time. But if you were going to talk to someone outside of healthcare, you know, what, how would you describe not only the, your role as a chief quality officer, but what quality means in a healthcare setting? Well, you know, I think that we all um, kind of come into medical school and learn the, the Hippocratic Oath, um, do no harm. And I think that, you know, a lot of people when they're coming to uh, see a healthcare provider are looking for, um, for answers and for healing. And uh, there are lots of things that can happen uh, through that process. And our, our goal is we try to improve on a day-by-day -day basis is really to make sure that we are kind of doing better in terms of achieving a diagnosis, um, improving outcomes, and also improving the experience that uh, 
patients and their families have when they come into the healthcare setting. It can be uh, a very stressful time. Um, and uh, a lot of people, you know, we're doing perfectly fine. You know, all of a sudden this hits them like a, a lightning bolt and they've got a new diagnosis. And we really want to be sure that we're not defining people by that diagnosis, but defining them by everything else that is critical in their life. Uh, and so when I think about um, quality, it's to make sure that we can get people in, provide them the best care possible, but get them back to their life where that is possible and to allow them to live uh, the fullest life in every case. Well, that's a, a great answer and probably not what people expected uh, when I started off with that question. I love that and I have to keep that in mind uh, myself. Okay, so we will get into COVID. Um, you know, we'll I'll ask you some questions, Michael, that we've actually had on the show before about vaccines uh, and and um, symptoms of COVID and what to do. But also, there's so much new information nearly every week. And so let's start with one of those. Can you just talk a little bit about um, your thoughts on the CDC guidelines that were supposed to be released last week, but came out uh, Monday, I believe, and how you think those may affect us for the next month or two? Yeah, you know, I think that there's been a lot of reporting on the CDC uh, guidelines and, you know, at times some misinterpretation of, of what exactly uh, they mean. So I'm glad we have an opportunity to clarify that a little bit. There's a wonderful um, kind of scientific page that goes along with the guidelines where you can read about why they're making the decisions that they are. Um, and so a lot of this is really rooted in science that continues to uh, evolve. What I will say is that we have thankfully been seeing cases come down um, and depending on how you count things, and it's hit different parts of the country at different times, we really have had three waves of COVID. We kind of had the initial wave uh, in uh, April uh, and uh, then that began to settle down. And then as we went past Memorial Day and into the summer, we had a second wave um, and that hit different areas of the country. So if you thought of kind of New York's and Boston uh, that were hit early on, now we were seeing the Midwest and the Southwest and the South. And then we had the fall period and into the winter, which was the third wave. And that was really the, the wave that had the highest peak in terms of hospitalizations and deaths and, and diagnosed illness. And we are, we're really seeing improvement. So I think there's a lot to celebrate, but there's also a lot of people being a little wary because what we know is throughout the past year, we've learned that when we've uh, backed off too quickly from some of the mitigation efforts that have been in place that we've seen a resurgence. And so folks are concerned about not having a fourth wave hit before we get enough people vaccinated. And that's why you see this debate about what you can and cannot do. I think a, a good way of thinking about it is that um, over the next few months, we're going to be gradually turning the faucet back on. And it's not like a light switch. We don't turn this on and off. You need to take this in a stepwise approach because that allows you to really see the impact and to back off if you see that things are going in the wrong direction. And so the CDC guidance that came out this week was really looking at what you could do if you're vaccinated. And it was very focused on um, what you do in your own private residence. Um, it was not intended to impact things like restaurants or gyms. It was, not, it was not intended, um, nor have states really adjusted to having this change when we do in healthcare settings. Um, and so we're gonna be doing a lot of the same things when you come into the clinic, when you come into the hospital. But in an individual home where you've got a small group, if you have everyone who's vaccinated, you can safely gather together um, and remove your masks and have a dinner party. You know, they want for that to be really, you know, maybe two groups coming together. The more people you have in that room, the higher the risk will be. Um, it is said that if you have one group that is vaccinated and another that is not vaccinated, again, uh, it can be done. This was really focused on, say, grandparents. We've been vaccinating a lot of grandparents who've been a year without seeing their family. Um, they can gather with their loved ones. They can hug and kiss. Um, they, you know, they can make those choices. Again, the idea is you'd bring, you know, a small group together with those people at any given time. You're not going to have a giant uh, feast where you bring all the family members together at the same time. Again, because the more people you have in the room, uh, the higher the risk. No vaccine is 100% effective. 
Um, and then if there are people in the room that themselves have a predisposition to severe illness, someone you know, who has chronic lung disease or obesity or many of the other things that we kind of know are risk factors for uh, more severe COVID illness, Masks are still a personal choice, and and in the in the in the home environment, it may actually be the best choice to wear masks, even if you're vaccinated. If you're worried that you have someone that would be at risk, and so um, I was just speaking with someone today who's fully vaccinated and has stopped wearing an N95, but really still feels comfortable with the mask and feels they're not ready. And I said, you know that. That again is a personal choice. You understand there are new variants out there. You understand that it's not 100%. Um, you've made a choice to move from an N95 to a mask, but each person is going to kind of have this discussion um, and be in a different comfort level over the next few months. What I will say is if the numbers continue to go down, you will see that we start to see new guidance from the CDC about what can open up. So right now you can go to a restaurant, but you want to ask, does that restaurant have the tables distanced? Do they limit the number of people at each table? Do they have you wear a mask until you get to the table? All those things are evidence-based. And if the restaurant isn't doing those things, you want to think to yourself, maybe this isn't a place I want to be. You know, you ask about movie theaters. You know, a lot of movie theaters are opening, but they're spacing things out and having you kind of separate from other groups. It's difficult to run a business where you can't fill your seats. Um, and so, but right now that is the safest thing to do. Um, so we'll get guidance as we go along. I will say things are reopening and we just need to keep a close eye on the numbers. I'm hopeful that we actually are at the point having vaccinated some of our most at risk individuals, but we most certainly have not vaccinated a sufficient amount of the population to reopen everything. Uh, that's gonna take getting kind of eight times uh, the current number of people vaccinated. We're just crossing 10% and we have to cross 80%. Well, Dr. Calderwood, you say that so eloquently and it is just great to hear. You also simplify it. And that's one of the problems we're seeing is that uh, first off, the CDC is doing uh, what I believe is an excellent job now, a real turnaround in how they're communicating in a timely manner and, and, um, and the process by which they go about um, communicating with the public. But unfortunately, no matter how hard they try, it is complex unless uh, you're someone like yourself or, or me or my co our colleagues who do this every day. And um, so the way you, you give that advice is, is uh, perfect for them. It's recognizing uh, unless there are barriers that we don't anticipate that things will get um, more and more free. Uh, but doing so now could have uh, unintended consequences you know, for, for the whole country, but certainly for a region, and then slow down the pace of this, of this recovery. Um, and I like how you explain that uh, you can have people over that are vaccinated. If there's unvaccinated people or people at high risk, uh, that's when you need to be careful. And maybe it's just not time to do that yet uh, until you get more people vaccinated. Speaking of that, um, I assume you're vaccinated? So I am vaccinated. My wife is vaccinated. Our children are not, um, and uh, but our uh, our parents are. And so we are beginning to make plans for our grandparents to to come up. We've been able to do that at times, um, kind of with masks and outside. It got a little harder through the winter months, but everyone's very excited to finally be able to visit. Um, and so I've just been hearing from my father-in-law, and uh, he's just counting the days till he can visit. And um, it'll be nice to. I, I won't say that we didn't sneak hugs now and again, but it, it'll be nice to really not have that same fear and to be able to have that interaction. Absolutely. And then hopefully in this fall and winter, we can get the children uh, vaccinated, which is something we can uh, talk about later in the show if we, if we have a little time. Let me, let me move into the variants. You mentioned the variants. Uh, we've talked about that, uh, the variants a few times on the show. And it's important um, to recognize that they're real and they do pose certain risks, but that also uh, some of the information we heard earlier turns out uh, not to be as scary as, as first talked about. Uh, and it was reported in Vermont, I think it was earlier this week or maybe late last week uh, of the first detection of, a, of a, the UK variant um, in, in Vermont. Of course, we know it's probably been here for a while. Um, so do you have any comments on that and what people should be doing differently now with this news, if anything? Well, we, we actually expected the UK variant to be the dominant variant in the United States by uh, March. So the fact that it's just showing up or at least detected for the first time in Vermont uh, kind of follows the pattern 
uh, we were expecting. Um, it does have a uh, slightly higher um, degree of transmissibility. Uh, there's some debate about uh, the severity of illness and whether it is less or, or equal uh, or even slightly more than others. And, uh, depending on the paper you read, you'll, you'll find different things. Um, what I would say is um, we have good data now that the current vaccines are actually effective against the UK variant. We have um, kind of post-market data um, on uh, Pfizer out of, uh, of Israel. We have uh, data on the uh, Janssen vaccine out of uh, both the UK uh, and uh, South Africa. Uh, again, some of these variants, not just the UK one, but uh, some of the ones out in South Africa and Brazil as well. So um, what we are uh, particularly excited about is for uh, severe disease. And so if we look at uh, severe disease, meaning disease that would lead you to be hospitalized or to end up in an ICU or even to, to unfortunately die, um, these uh, vaccines, any of the three, are actually quite effective uh, against the most common circulating variants. It is possible that uh, going into next fall, uh, we may require a booster. And we know that respiratory viruses can mutate over time. And that's why um, we kind of get updates on our flu vaccine. There are kind of two reasons for that. Influenza vaccination tends to wane a little bit after about nine months. Um, and so that's part of the reason to get a booster. But the other is that there are new circulating uh, variants or strains uh, in any given year. And so you do need to update the vaccine. And we think that we'll probably get to a point where COVID is very similar. Do you feel pretty confident that these um, uh, pharmaceutical companies in collaboration with, uh, with the government and then as well as uh, uh, philanthropic organizations are gonna be able to create these boosters uh, at, a, at a good pace and, and address some of the concerns with variants? So, I mean, right now, um, what we know is that there are trials opening up where they're inserting a new piece of mRNA in uh, targeting the variants. Uh, and that may be part of this booster arm that would go uh, in the fall. So people are already beginning to, to look at that. The benefit of the mRNA uh, vaccines is a novel technology. Is it's very easy to swap out one piece of messenger RNA for another. And so if you see that you need to make changes, so messenger RNA is red and creates a protein, which then can trigger your immune system uh, to develop immunity. And so if that protein needs changes, you need to change the messenger RNA, you can kind of swap one, in, uh, one out and the other in. Um, the production issue is always gonna be a challenge. Um, and so messenger RNA vaccines um, are hampered a little bit in being able to scale up uh, production. And so I think there's gonna be an answer for um, kind of the developed world but my bigger concern right now actually is this issue that uh, disease anywhere is disease everywhere. Um, and we're not going to uh, put this issue to rest um, until we have really vaccinated a large portion of the global population. And right now that's where we're struggling. You know, we have encouraging data on the number of vaccines and when we'll be able to get to herd immunity here in the United States. We have other countries that have bought massive amounts of vaccine. But then you've got large uh, areas like many areas in Africa where they're struggling to get things started. And so we really need to think about uh, this not being a country by country effort, but a global effort. And that's gonna be critical to end this pandemic. I totally agree. Um, maybe adding a little bit of commentary quickly. It's, uh, it's right for us to make sure we can get our, our population vaccinated so that we are healthy then to go out and do what uh, our country has done such a good job of, and that is uh, help other countries in need. Yes, there are times when we haven't done that, but this is an opportunity to really shine. It's sort of like um, pulling down the oxygen mask in a plane, putting it on yourself first, but then going ahead and addressing the concerns uh, around the world. So I hope, uh, I know that in medicine, uh, we all wanna be a part of that. We all wanna see it happen. Um, as we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up because one of the goals of this show is to keep it within 30 minutes so that people can get a good quick listen. I'm gonna ask two more quick questions. Um, can you just make some comments? We do have these three choices in vaccines and no matter how much we talk about it or how much uh, the New York Times or uh, the Washington Post write about it, people still have questions. Can you just comment, especially on uh, Johnson & Johnson just because it's the, the newer of the three? 
Yeah, and so you know, I think that uh, really, uh, you know, I've got I've been vaccinated, and so I received the Moderna vaccine. That was the one that was available on the day that uh, I went in. Um, you know, I think that each vaccine um, has slightly different data and was studied at, at slightly different times. But actually, if you um, compare them, uh, they actually are quite comparable. They're quite comparable in terms of uh, the side effects, and these are. Um, kind of typical side effects that uh, we see as you develop immunity. You're going to have a, a sore arm. Some people may have uh, fever and muscle aches, very short-lived, and they tend to resolve in, in, in a day or two. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of their effectiveness, they've really been looking at different things. And so people will hear 95% and 90% and 62% and depends on the country where we're studied and the variant that was going around. But I think what you really want to focus in on is what is the effectiveness in keeping you out of the hospital and keeping you from getting very ill. And so what really excites me about the Johnson & Johnson or what others are referring to as the Janssen vaccine um, is that it really was around 85% effective in multiple countries, including in Brazil and Africa, where they had uh, predominance of strains or variants that we actually were concerned might cause issues with lower effectiveness of these vaccines. And this vaccine continued to be quite effective in preventing people from um, being hospitalized, ending up on uh, kind of a ventilator and really did not have any deaths in the arm where people got vaccinated. So it is a very good uh, vaccine. The other benefit is you only need one shot. And so you don't need to come back in three to four weeks for that second shot. Um, and so we're, I would, it's not comparing apples to apples uh, at the same time. We need to get, you know, millions of people vaccinated, hundreds of millions of people vaccinated. Um, when it is your turn, I would say that you should feel comfortable getting any of the vaccines that have been approved. We currently have uh, three that have been approved. I've looked at the data on all three um, and I would roll up my own sleeve uh, and uh, get the shot uh, for any of them. And I've spoken to my own family about that. They've asked this question of, well, should I get one versus the other? And the answer is no, you should get the one that's available. Um, and it is really everyone's responsibility, as long as they don't have some significant contraindication uh, to really step forward uh, and get vaccinated. That is, we aren't gonna get out of this pandemic uh, until we get over 80% of our population vaccinated. These are very safe, very effective. And the fact that we have three of them within a year of this new disease being identified is incredible. I mean, this is comparable to us sending someone to the moon. It really was our moonshot. And the scientists who got behind this, uh, there are gonna be books written about it. This is an incredible story. Well, oh, that is just great the way you've said that. I have to remember some of those quotes. It's awesome. I, I also just say that uh, I'm so happy to see that at least up in, in Vermont and New Hampshire, um, all three vaccines are really being readily accepted. You know, we're vaccinating uh, educators and some other professions in Vermont uh, now, and we're going to be starting here in Southern Vermont on Saturday with the Johnson & Johnson, and the clinics have been just uh, signed up immediately in full um, I have to say, I totally agree with you too. If today I was getting vaccinated and I actually had a choice, I don't think I could choose because there's really no choice. It's just give me one. Perhaps I'd go with the Johnson and Johnson just so I wouldn't have to come back um, for that reason, but no, no advantage there. Well, I'm going to finish with, uh, with a question that's near and dear to my heart. I am a huge Alabama football fan because that's where I'm from originally. I did not go to school there. I did not play football there, but I definitely follow the football team, which of course is easy to do right now. It's harder to do in, in other times. Can I go to a game this fall? Or actually I should say, should I go to to a game this fall in a packed stadium? So I think the question was actually asked to me, uh, would I be buying tickets? And uh, I think as a, uh, as a diehard fan, uh, you absolutely should be buying tickets. I think that we will, you know, it's really hard with a, we don't, none of us have a crystal ball. I think we're very hopeful um, that we'll be at a point next fall that we will be able to do a lot of these things uh, that we kind of feel are normal going to large sporting events. Um, so I am planning as if that will uh, be possible, thinking about you know, what sorts of vacations one might take at that time and uh, what you could do in larger crowds. So I would say I'm hopeful at the same time, 
I, you know, it depends. If things are different and the community transmission rates are such in the fall that it's not safe, we have to be ready to kind of pivot. Uh, but I'm hopeful that we'll be in a much different spot come fall of 2021. Well, that's great. Great answer. I'm going to buy my tickets today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us on Medical Matters Weekly. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Michael Calderwood from Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, as well as Mike Cutler from CAT TV, uh, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, and Ashley Jowett, also from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>